it's the summer it's love. Hey folks, welcome back. I'm your host, R.R. Slugger, and this is bad advice for making videos, at least the way I make them. As I started this little project, I was reminded of the phrase, all advice is bad advice. If you followed your own advice, you wouldn't be where you are today. Does anyone know who said that? I tried to look for someone to attribute the quote to, but I came up short. I thought it might have been Jeff Vogel, but I wasn't able to confirm. Anyways, this is how I make my videos, and I can assure you that everything in here is bad advice. Starting at the beginning, I script my videos in a Word document. Everyone has a different writing style, but I'm fortunate that mine matches my speaking style quite closely. This leads to less headaches later on in the process. Typically, I try to organize my scripts into small paragraphs that I'll be able to easily speak through when it comes time to record. I don't eliminate breaths in between each sentence like some creators on YouTube, but I do remove the breaths in between paragraphs. This allows me to record the spoken word in chunks that can be easily stitched together later. I usually don't edit my writing in drafts. Instead, I speak through it as I type. Any awkward sentences are generally caught long before it comes time to record. This means that every paragraph has typically been rehearsed half a dozen times, even before a microphone is involved. After the script passes muster, I print it out and get ready to record. This involves setting up my microphone and audio editing computer, a separate device entirely from my video editing computer. Notably, this one does not connect to the internet at all. I don't want Windows Update messing with things in the background. Audio editing software is complex and notoriously prone to breaking with innocuous updates. My best bad advice for audio editing is once you have a setup that works, disconnect it from the internet and never update. I use Cubase for my digital audio workstation and barring one small upgrade in 2017, this computer has never seen cyberspace since. Now it comes time to record. I'm using a Blue Spark microphone and Steinberg CI2 Plus audio interface and have been without fail for over a decade. A pop filter is also a must, and I prefer to keep mine quite a distance away from the mic. I stand as I speak, and in order to read the scripts as I go, I fold each page in half to reduce the rustling sounds and hold them out in front of me. Every single video. Did I mention this was bad advice? <laughs> Once the audio is recorded to my liking, we enter the editing phase. Within Cubase, I've set up grid line markers that'll help gauge how much distance to put between paragraphs. I never used to do this, which resulted in uneven pauses in some videos, but nowadays I essentially have it down to a science. I'm confident I could edit audio visually now, and that's actually what I do. This is the part of the process where I get to feel the most cool. I set up my playhead at the start, begin playback, and get to work. All of my audio editing is done in real time, or even future time. I'm always staying several steps ahead of the playback, laying down the track as we move along. Essentially, I'm stitching everything together visually and just keeping tabs on what's going on with the audio in the background. If I hear something strange, I pause playback and return to the scene of the crime. If not, I keep moving along, arriving at the finish line long before the playhead catches me. When the video is short, this could mean it's just a minute or two of waiting around for the audio to finish playback. In my nearly four hour Slugger's second birthday video, I beat the playhead to the finish line by over 40 minutes. Once we're done here, I mix down the audio and send it off to WaveLab to be mastered. The mastering step is unremarkable. I simply visually account for how many decibels the track needs to be boosted, then put on a peak limiter. Next, we bounce it out as a WAV file and stick it on a USB drive to transport back to the first computer. I use DaVinci Resolve 17 for all of my video editing needs. Again, once you have a stable build, don't update it. All an update can do is ruin what's already working for you. I start by laying out my audio and mixing it with the music for the full run of the video before adding any visuals. Sometimes this means finding the perfect spot to transition from one music track to another. Sometimes this means moving spoken word sections slightly so they land on the beat of the music. I don't treat the music in my videos as wallpaper. The music is meant to be noticed, and I think it's one of the greatest tools I have in creating organic flow throughout. 
Consequently, this is one of the main reasons you don't see mid-roll ads in my videos. Why would I go through all this work making the audio feel seamless only to insert ad breaks later? Now I import the rest of the clips and photos I need to make the video. But where does this footage come from? In order to answer that, we have to talk photography. I use a Canon Rebel T3i to photograph LEGO, and one of the smartest decisions I made before starting this channel was to pony up for decent gear. I bought a nice tripod, a good pair of adjustable lamps, and perhaps most importantly, a remote shutter. This just makes it all the easier and quicker to snap photos, and this simple accessory has paid dividends in its quality of life improvements. When it comes to camera settings, here are some to get you started, but I highly recommend test driving your own rig extensively before settling on something. I was trying various bulbs, various white balance settings, f-stop values, the works. Even nowadays, I still often take photos at two different shutter speeds, so I have options later. My backdrops are simply pieces of poster paper bought at a stationery store. Modest and inexpensive solutions sometimes work best. Lighting and focus become important when photographing LEGO up close. Typically, I like to have one lamp hovering above and behind the subject, and the other in line with the camera. Sometimes they need small adjustments to eliminate glare, but this is generally the setup that has worked for me since the very first video on this channel. When it comes to focus pull, usually I find that minifigure faces take priority. Occasionally there's something more interesting in a shot, but oftentimes the eye is drawn to the faces, so I prioritize them. I also do a small amount of stop motion animation work within my videos. I know it can be impressive to see something come to life before your eyes, but these really are easier than they look. If you are a hobbyist like me and want to improve your animations, here are two very easy strategies. Control your setup and control your lighting. What I mean by this is you'll want to have your camera locked down and everything in front of it secured. I use painter's tape for this, but there are other solutions as well. For lighting, you need to eliminate all ambient light from the room. This is what causes flicker in some animations. Closing doors and blinds can help, but I've found the most surefire method to be simply recording stop motion at night. Once I capture the footage I need, I get to work to editing within Resolve. This is another fun part for me, as this is when the video truly comes to life. I often get comments regarding the editing and polish my videos have, and I want to emphasize that what I do in the program is not difficult. I'm an amateur in every sense of the word. I had never used this program or really any video editing program before my first Rock Raiders video. However, what I lacked in skill, I made up for in effort. You can do this if you want to put in the effort. There's no secret talent behind Slugger. I didn't go to film school. We never had computer programs like this when I was young. If there's one takeaway from this video, I hope it's that. I believe quality rises to the surface, even if it takes time. I was making videos for the same hundred people back then, and while that might seem quaint compared to the channel's current size, I was, and still am, making videos for me first and foremost. I think you've got to do it for you. If you're happy with the video, then that's the only metric of success that matters. Anyways, that's my bad advice when it comes to making videos. If anything, I hope you draw inspiration from my reasons for making them rather than my methods. Once again, this video has been brought to you by The Summer of Slug, and my thanks go out to all of those who helped make it happen. If you want in on the fun, check out the link in the description. I've been your host, RR Slugger, and I'll see you next time for another video.